Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, people are starting to filter in from the waiting room. Uh, I'm Craig McAtee, the CEO and Executive Director of the National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers. And we're here with two of our longtime great strategic partners, Festo, Festo Didactic, and Siemens. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to speed through this because we've got the A team of Industry 4.0 Smart Manufacturing today, and I don't want to hold them up because you're going to love all the great stuff they're going to share with you. But just a quick overview of NCATC for those of you who might not know us. Our four uh, strategic pillars are the future of work, have been for 35 years of our existence. We are an affiliated council of the American Association Community College. They entrust us to give them feedback from the field on all things uh, future work, industry 4.0, smart manufacturing, et cetera. And our second pillar is work-based learning, everything from a full-blown strategic or a, a registered apprenticeship uh, to internships, co-ops, and even entrepreneurship. Third pillar happens to be competency-based education, uh, a whole lot more important where the applied skills and knowledge coupled with industry-recognized credentials and certifications are part of the workforce planning and training. And last but not least, wrapped around everything is our diversity, equity, and inclusion for adult learning for those underserved and underrepresented populations. Very important to keep all boats rising. Next slide, please. We are out of the 1,153 community and technical colleges in the, in the nation, represented about 170 of those in about 32 states. You can see the map here. But even more uh, important than all those great members of education uh, are the 48 strategic corporate par partners that we have like Festo and Siemens. Next slide. Those folks are represented by this slide, and those, uh, most of them you probably are, are aware of if you're working in the advanced technology or manufacturing world. You know, everybody from uh, Festo to Siemens, as we mentioned, but uh, a lot of folks like AMT and Fanuc Robotics and Mastercam, Lincoln Electric and Miller, all those folks that you see, and you can find them all on our website, ncatc.org, are part of our network on a daily basis for hands-on experiential learning and online uh, uh, learning as well. Next slide. We also work very closely with eight of the 19 uh, Manufacturing USA Institutes. Very important to what we're doing here today with uh, smart manufacturing and automation. Everybody from the Additive Manufacturing Group up in Youngstown, Ohio by America Makes to ARM, the robotics group, NextFlex on the West Coast with flexible electronics, composites in Tennessee, et cetera. Those are all listed here. And the last slide I want to share with you before we introduce Ted Rozier is just a quick overview of how we've attacked uh, over the last 10 years moving into from mechatronics into Industry 4.0 and those big data analytics, artificial intelligence, intelligence, augmented reality, systems integration, cybersecurity wrapped around all the data uh, that we're talking about, and it's all connected to the industrial internet of things. You're going to hear a lot more detail about that from the next uh, hour here with you and, and Festo and Siemens and their team. In the last slide, I want to take uh, a minute to just look at who's here today, uh, and I'm going to introduce Ted Rozier, who's the Director of Engineering for Festo Didactic. He's going to take it from there, and we'll have uh, chat, use the chat box for questions along the way. We'll queue those up for the end, as well as uh, there'll be brief bios uh, given to you today, but look, any of these wonderful uh, folks up on LinkedIn, you'll get more of a depth of their backgrounds. And we are recording this, as you probably can tell, and it will be posted on our website in the next 48 hours for your refresh. Okay, on to you, Ted, and thanks for your time. Greg, <clears throat> thank you so much for uh, uh, allowing uh, Festo Siemens, um, as well as uh, the, our other uh, partners in PTC, SIC, and BYU uh, to have the platform to talk about uh, a topic that we all have so much passion around. Um, when we look at uh, today's topic, I think that there is a uh, phrase within our mind, um, and there's a lot of buzzwords around it. You can see in this slide, Industry 4.0, um, and a lot of people talk about Industry 5.0 already, uh, and, and so forth so on and so forth. Uh, but our number one goal today, um, we, we, we are, are going to make sure that uh, through this webinar, uh, 
uh, that we're able to define uh, where industry 4.0 methods or smart manufacturing methods, uh, what does that look like uh, within the manufacturing space? Um, now, what comes with industry 4.0 are a lot of buzzwords, we might say, and the goal is demystification. So uh, to get us started, um, I want to make sure that we're in the right frame of mind. When we talk about industry 4.0, uh, one of the key terms would be cyber physical systems. Uh, basically, when we talk about cyber physical systems, we're talking about, uh, uh, and, and this is a term that you're going to hear throughout our discussion, a data rich experience. Uh, do you have true interoperability within your system? Okay, so think, first of all, cyber physical system on the forefront of your mind. The second thing, uh, when you ha have a system that is connected properly uh, within your factory, uh, you can now get into the system approach with connecting the complete factory together. Uh, but then uh, we're going to talk about the t tangible methods that go along with cyber physical systems in digital twin, in augmented reality, and robotic safety. So we know that with ro robots are definitely a part of the automation uh, within a smart manufacturing a factory or a factory that is uh, looking to bring in manufacturing methods. But outside of a collaborative robot, outside of an industrial robot, we're going to focus our attention on uh, the safety of the robot. Um, so with that being said, uh, uh, moving on, uh, we want to move from point solutions to a fully automated smart factory. So we're not talking about automation a la carte, but we're moving on to an automated smart factory. And what does that look like? What are, where can you get started? So without further ado, we'll start off with, uh, with our first panelist, uh, uh, Gary, uh, I'm sorry, Jerry, uh, Jerry leads a team of academic enablement professionals across the Americas for Siemens Digital Industries uh, in software. Now, he focuses on helping academia become relevant for manufacturers as they face the challenge of sustainment within their innovation, validation, and manufacturing life cycles. So we'll go ahead and get started with Jerry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gary's first Jerry's, right. first, Jerry's first question. Uh, Jerry, can you please provide the audience with insight on Siemens' approach to the digital twin? Sure. Thanks, Ted. Next slide, please. So first of all, we've been in business, obviously, a long time. Uh, actually, last count was about 175 years. A lot of that is by learning and looking at the future of what we do. Uh, the thing that is actually, I think, hit everybody and every company that's out there is something called digital transformation. Well, digital transformation at its core is the digital element of what it could be. If you take a look below, you see the comprehensive digital twin, a personalized, adaptable, modern approach, as well as open systems, meaning interoperability to a lot of things. Next slide, please. So when we take a look at the digital twin, think of something in virtual space. This is an example of a factory floor. So at the base of the floor, you've got the real product that you're building, but you have the digital twin of the product, meaning an exact duplicate. So when you start to model something within that virtual space, you start to look at it, you really need to make sure that it can be built, that it's going to really represent the product that you're designing. And so something we heard in industry years ago, the part has to match the print. Next slide, please. So our approach to the digital twin is what we see here. We have what we call the product digital twin, which can be basically looked at as design engineering. But then we have an ability to build it, and that's where production comes into play. So how do we take what we've designed, and how do we ensure and validate and verify that it can be built? But then you get to the other element, which are the performance elements of the twin. Good example of that. Are you getting mean time between failure recognition for what you designed and from design intent from the beginning of it? And then finally, are you also meeting the goals of the customer? Are you meeting the needs? So does the product perform to the way it was designed? 
And finally, we have all of the assets. It's not just, and as Ted just mentioned, it's big data. It's a lot of data. It's connected. So now you're taking a look at all of this information and implementing it into a digital twin to make sure that you can validate and verify what you're looking at in virtual space, and ultimately it can be built. That's pretty much uh, what we look at from a digital twin perspective. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We really appreciate uh, your explanation. We'll now move on to uh, Mark Schutz uh, from PTC. And Mark is the VP of Augment Reality. He's a product manager. Um, as the vice president of Euphoria Product Management at PTC, his role is responsible for defining the strategy and roadmap for Euphoria Studio. Uh, so, Mark, we'd like to go ahead and get into your first question. Uh, can you please provide the audience with PTC's point of view on how augmented reality relates to the digital twin? Absolutely, Ted. So the digital twin or digital twins in channel can be used to um, reflect and better understand their physical counterparts and uh, offer insights by, by leveraging multiple data sets, for example, IoT data, as we, as we just heard, right? And um, from my perspective, there's no digital twin if you do not have a physical counterpart, which informs it. So we are bringing data from the physical twin um, via sensors, via IoT platforms uh, into the digital twin, into the digital world. And then the digital twin can be leveraged in several different ways. But on the other hand, how do you bring this um, digital knowledge, this digital know-how back into the physical world, right? Uh, into the hands? How do you give this back into the hands of the frontline workers standing in front of the, of the real product of, uh, yeah, in the real world, trying to, to better operate a product, to better build a manufacturer or a service, any kind of product informed by the insights, the insights derived from the digital twin. And that is exactly what augmented reality can provide. We're using IoT platforms to get data from the physical world into the digital world and form the digital twin, making sense out of it, analyzing it, and then bring, using augmented reality to bring it back into the hands of the frontline worker. And augmented reality is a highly visual, very, very interactive method of presenting relevant digital information in the context of a physical environment or product. And that's very important, right? The physical environment or the physical product in that context. And uh, at PTC, we, we really specialize in industrial augmented reality, we, um, which focus on uh, connecting employees and um, to critical information, right? Uh, when and where they need it. So employees like manufacturing engineers, like service engineers, think uh, the entire front line. And AR can be used to create and deliver easily consumable work instructions to frontline workers by overlaying these digital information, digital content onto real world environments. And um, again, we think about sensor information combined with the insights from the digital twin delivered in a clear and easy to understand instruction. And the outcome our customers are seeing are really much better in, um, information delivery, um, faster knowledge transfer, really modernized training methods and immediate access to um, remote expertise. And uh, from my perspective, AI is really reshaping how frontline employees acquire knowledge. and uh, digitally interact with their physical surroundings informed by data. And there are clear business benefits like, um, like faster execution, less errors, less manual, manual um, processes. Um, it's just overall better decision-making, right? Um, if we can provide the frontline with data where and when they need it, they will simply make better decisions. And that's what we try to do with all of this. Mark, thank you very much for that explanation. And we look forward to uh, use cases to support uh, that the information that you provided. Um, we'll now go ahead and move on to uh, Chris Serrano of SIC, um, SIC Inc. Um, Chris is uh, the safety standards. Uh, he is a safety standards and competence manager for the SIC organization. Uh, he's responsible for regional and global safety competency and directing safety standardization uh, for the work within the Americas. Uh, so welcome, Chris. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started with your first question. Uh, when it comes to the safety within a smart manufacturing environment, what are the latest trends that you're seeing, especially when it comes to robotics and safety? Yeah, that's a great question, Ted. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, for me, it's it starts with summarizing this and click one more. This kind of goes back to your previous comment about the cyber physical system, right? We're trying to improve performance aspects by com combining the cyber and the physical 
But the, the key element that we have to still consider is the human sphere, right? There's still humans involved in things uh, as much as automation and smart manufacturing continues to progress. There's still many touch points and, and safety especially is accounting for those touch points and the interactions with those, with the human workers in the um, automation environment. So if you go to the next slide, looking at really at the trends, uh, first one, uh, it starts with agility. If you click it for me, uh, it's agility combined with efficiency, right? That's what smart manufacturing is. And those, of course, directly relate right into automating things. Uh, it's the smart manufacturing, it's all those things. And then, of course, the safety is the key component. As we add more automation, uh, the ability for machinery to start and run automatically, um, it's easy to understand and to model those in a, in a cyber world or in an AR world. Uh, but when, when the unknown element, the human, is exposed to it, those are the things we really have to focus on from a safety perspective. Uh, so if you go to the next one then, of course, security relates into that, uh, especially cybersecurity. And again, with that human element, um, if somebody can log into a system from halfway around the world and make a program change, uh, how are, do, does that, and if so, how does it change the safety or the risks that people are exposed to on the floor next to the actual real life equipment? And then the next one, of course, is then the sustainability, right? How do we make it so that we can sustain the system uh, throughout the life cycle of the production systems? So if you go to the next one, specifically when we talk about, about safety and trends in safety and robotics, um, it, it's sick. We call this creating safe productivity, right? How do we use technology to maintain the highest level of safety with the smallest impact on efficiency? And some of the things we're seeing with advances in technologies and applications, um, all being driven by standardization, of course. Uh, first one is um, ways to provide uh, safety of people, but still allowing material to flow in and out of production cells, as we see here uh, on the next slide. Uh, another example is how do we uh, enable or support automatic restarting of the system, of course, by ensuring a certain level of safety. Uh, in the middle there, you see a more advanced application with a collaborative robot where traditionally it's running entirely by itself. Every once in a while, a human may sporadically come in to, to inspect a part or pick up a piece. Um, and how do we um, ensure the highest level of production and throughput in that system as, as much as possible. On the next slide, then, we see um, advancement of some of these concepts that have been around a while, but they're, they're starting to pick up um, more applicability, especially in the smart manufacturing world, uh, especially if we, as we talk about integrating machinery into a system uh, where those systems can be augmented on the fly for mass customization. And part of that is creating control zones so you can segment a space where the person is operating, doing their tasks safely without hindering production. And then on the last slide, uh, another example is, is, again, that collaborative idea where humans and machinery are collaborating in real time. Um, the days of isolating the motion and the, the machinery from the people um, entirely is, is way behind us, right? So having the ability to, to hand off material to the robot, whether it's a fixed robot like on the left or, or a mobile robot, uh, whether it's um, a guided vehicle or an autonomous vehicle, uh, or what we see in the middle is real life application, it's a portable fixed robot. So in this example, the, the company takes this robot, it's on casters, they move it to a cell where they need it, they automate it, and they still have that certain level of, of interaction and collaboration with the person who still needs to do some of those periodic tasks and trying to come up with the best safety solution possible, not forgetting that human element. <clears throat> Thank you for that, uh, Chris. We really appreciate your uh, your. Uh, answer to that question. And the other thing that stands out um, when we go back to just overall smart manufacturing methods is uh, Chris showed some really nice samples or examples of uh, the area scanners uh, that, that, that uh, are around robotics, uh, but outside of the safety in, in addition uh, would be also the data that you're able to capture uh, and, and, and then uh, be able to push that data to, to not only uh, augmented reality uh, type displays to, to assist the, the, the operator, but just collecting that data along with the safety method is, is so important. So thank you for that, Chris. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll Absolutely. go ahead and move. 
we'll move on to Mark. Um, Mark, uh, what use cases can you share to assist us in understanding why and uh, how augmented reality is currently being used within the manufacturing uh, and general industries? Uh, maybe you can start off with the why, uh, Mark. Absolutely. Let's, let, let's start with the why. And um, we, we said augmented reality enables people to visualize information and uh, understand it in a way they, they normally aren't able to, right? And, uh, which is in the real context. There's no, um, in the, in the, you know, there's no ambiguity of uh, what it actually means and where it belongs to. Like when you drive on your road and you look on your navigation system and then uh, you go on a rotary and you miss the exit, it happens to everyone because you need to do this mental, um, mental shift, right? And um, understanding things in the real context uh, of the product, of the machine, of the factory itself is, is very clear. And um, yeah, by doing so, um, we, we will really improve the, the efficiency of the workforce. And that's what we are going for with augmented reality. But um, um, let's jump into some real life examples. Huh? And um, I want to I want to start with an uh, uh, assembly instruction use case. So um, what we see in the industry is that um, products are becoming more more complex with um, many 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 configurations and. Uh, this high variability paired with the demand to get um, products out faster puts a lot of pressure on uh, assembly workers. And um, what we're seeing is that uh, using AR not only helps those workers uh, more easily adopt to uh, changing configurations, um, but it also helps to avoid errors and also brings uh, new workers up to speed faster. So that's a, that's, a, that's a great example where augmented reality really helps. In a quality inspection, inspection scenario is another one, right? Um, um, after the product is assembled, it, uh, it needs to be inspected. And AR can help uh, increase product quality, which results uh, in, in more satisfied uh, customers, right? And uh, reduce the cost uh, associated with them, scrap, rework, recalls, you name it. And uh, this is actually one of the most um, common uh, use cases right now we see. And then uh, in this scenario, you saw like uh, some checkboxes here and uh, some uh, X's. Um, we, we pair this um, with um, a trained neural network, so a form of artificial intelligence, which helps the uh, inspector to detect OK from uh, not OK. And um, this, is, this, this happens all under the hood, which is actually pretty fantastic. How you can combine augmented reality and artificial intelligence to um, help the workforce build better products. But it's not only about your products, right? Um, um, it's also about the machines and the next use case. Can you, can you go one, one slide forward? As much as I like that example, um, I have more. So, um, <laughs> so in this case, we, we talked about a machine setup and changeover instruction, right? And uh, using, using AR really, uh, using it for step-by-step -step instructions ensures them faster and more accurate changeover and line ramp up time by basically removing um, all any confusion that comes with a specific setup or a more complex process or where things happen. We can really transfer any kind of expert knowledge to anyone who needs it in that moment. And um, this is a great use case for that um, spatially aware AR. And then the, on, the, on the next slide, um, we see um, remote assistant, right? Another case for spatially aware um, augmented reality. And because um, sometimes we really need an expert um, to help solve a problem. And uh, using AR remote assistance um, um, can, can bring the expert right there, right there to you. And there's no ambiguity, right? By simply pairing AR mapping technologies with a um, video communication and creating annotations, they stay where they need to be, right? You annotate the physical world, share with the, the person who needs help. And um, that's just a, just a fantastic way of solving problems faster. But when we talk about spatial um, augment, um, augmented factory operations, a really big use case, which is uh, very popular right now. So machines, um, they keep your organization running, um, but they also need to be maintained. And, uh, sometimes uh, identifying the right machine that, uh, that need to be inspected or repaired or maintained is a, is a challenge. Um, um, how many assembly lines do you have where everything looks the same, right? Uh, five machines in a row all look the same. This is the first, the second, the third one. Um, we saw an error code coming up. We saw it on a dashboard, but where is it? And uh, Sometimes having all the machine telemetry data, the root cause, the procedures, everything at your fingertips where you are is really important because how often do you go somewhere else, find a binder about something, how the machine actually works, what that error code means. Um, this is all time, right? And uh, you time lost and uh, using AR for factory operations and navigation really ensures that uh, workers know where they are needed uh, as well as um, what to do and why. So it's a really fantastic use case. And, um, 
um, everything you have seen here uh, so far can be done today with our technology and it's, a, it's in the market, it's available, right? But, uh, but I also want to share on the next example, uh, a good use case on uh, our current research and um, our research on performance management. So to, to optimize the performance of your factory, it is, uh, it is really critical to understand how multiple machines, multiple systems, um, people, processes, material flow, um, how, how all of this works together and how long does a step take, right? When is it successfully completed? Uh, are, are kind of critical information, which are really difficult to capture sometimes. And uh, what we try to, to better understand here and uh, analyze in our research is um, how systems, how material flow and new employees can uh, better, um, more safe and, uh, and healthier um, work together to avoid any kind of um, bottlenecks uh, or issues. So we can, uh, we can really help um, um, yeah, improve the performance of your, your factory by uh, yeah, having waterfall and bottleneck analysis um, built with augmented reality as well as how people, uh, materials and, uh, and machines move and, and, and operate as, a, as an entire system. But yeah, that's a little bit of research and uh, has a lot of uh, a lot of interesting interesting things to do. Thanks so much, Mark. Mark, one question that I wanted to ask before we move on, <clears throat> because we're getting ready to trans, uh, transition our discussion uh, into how do we bring these smart manufacturing methods into uh, the education space, the classroom. Um, yeah. and, and, and Mark, uh, when it comes to the competencies that uh, someone would have to understand or know how to create an augmented reality experience, what would you say? What's your short answer? <laughs> my, my short answer is you, um, you should know what you do in, in, in the sense of uh, manufacturing, right? Uh, manufacturing know-how is obviously helpful and understanding of how um, processes in the factory work is, uh, is great. So how do I assemble something or how do I troubleshoot something based on the IoT data I get from a machine? And uh, no, that's, that's uh, fundamental, right? But we, we build all the tools that um, all the procedures can be documented uh, or created with them. Um, very little to no AR or uh, coding uh, or integration know-how. Um, that's pretty important for us uh, because if you need special know-how, you get less people in the world. And for very selfish reasons, I want to I wanna bring augmented reality to, to the masses. So we need to make it as easy as possible. And we want to enable as many workers um, to uh, capture, document, and create compelling AR experiences as, as possible. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate that. So, um, you know, a lot of times we get uh, a little uh, intimidated uh, when we start talking about these advanced methods, but that's one of the things that we are starting to see uh, is that it's easier to bring in some of these new methods uh, to, 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 to assist um, a more efficient factory floor. So appreciate that, Mark. Let's go ahead and move on uh, to, to now uh, um, Yuri Havansky of, of BYU. Um, and Yuri uh, joined the faculty of Brigham Young University as an associate professor of manufacturing engineering. Um, he is actively participates in numerous professional societies. Um, and in addition to that, uh, he's worked as a lead mechanical system engineer uh, for uh, uh, Bechtel National, uh, prior to joining Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, where he worked as a senior research engineer. Uh, so Yuri, uh, we'll go ahead and get started with your first question. Um, how are you leveraging the power of smart manufacturing augmented reality uh, within your classroom? Yeah, it's a great question. And really, to some degree, the answer is embedded in the very definition of what smart manufacturing is. And that's this notion that um, we have a merger between operational technology and informational technology. And if we miss that point in the messy middle between those two, then we really aren't leveraging what we want to as part of Industry 4.0. Um, what that means in the classroom is that we really have to create experiences where students can bring both the equipment and the software together and leverage those in a way that they can uh, demonstrate how industry 4.0 changes the paradigm. It doesn't just add to things. It's not just advanced automation and mechatronics, right? This is a change to how we're going about looking at things because we can sit at the merger of that information. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, it really focusing on how augmented reality specifically fits within that paradigm, 
um, is a really interesting question because just like merging uh, operational technology and informational technology is that larger area of smart manufacturing, augmented reality allows us to do that in a way where we can not only merge the operational knowledge of a user and the informational science and the tools that groups like Mark and others have put together, um, it allows us to play in this context where we can actually enhance learning, um, not just about Industry 4.0, but even about traditional operational technologies. Uh, you can see here uh, we have images of students working on uh, friction stir welding equipment, doing tool changes assisted through augmented reality. Um, on the bottom, we have a demonstration where a student is working with Festo Cyber F uh, Physical Lab and they're actually fully interacting with the data that's live on the PLC that's walking them through understanding how a pneumatic uh, process works on the overall factory. And the real benefit for us is that in our own uh, independent uh, and, and uh, independent studies within the university, we're showing that uh, education using augmented reality, whether with handhelds like smartphones or iPads or something like this, or even with wearables um, where we have complete hands-free technology, both of those are actually leading to uh, students being able to understand and to be able to come away feeling like they better understand what they're trying to learn about traditional operational technology. So in, our, in that next slide, the, how we go about doing this, um, we really have to create these opportunities where we can merge um, equipment situations uh, where we're teaching operational uh, science, whether that's automation techniques and PLCs or pneumatics and and mechatronics, those have to be married back in completely and completely connected across a cyber physical interface. Um, one of the ways that we've done this very successfully is to, to be able to deploy the, the PTC's Vuforia suite of software tools on Festo Didactic CP Lab. And so it creates this physical situation where we can use the digital tools and the full connectivity between sensors and PLCs and pneumatics and all these different systems that we have in a traditional factory. And students can understand what it means to be spatially connected to the equipment. Um, in those videos that Mark showed us earlier, we can have that situation where it directs a student to the location they need to work. They understand specifically how they need to interact. We can use the educational objectives both at the beginning of a set of training and a summary at the end of how they were able to complete those tasks to really help that them cogn uh, cognizantly understand the goals of the overall training and how they participated in that. The other thing it allows them to do is to recognize that um, Industry 4.0 allows people to connect to that data in a way that we can actually interact and troubleshoot these in a different way than we have. So it changes the paradigm of how people are interacting with that equipment. And that really creates this completely interactive experience where they're interacting with data and they're being spatially directed with the experience. And it leaves them feeling empowered in, in situations that might be overly complex for a new user or a new student. And that's, that's some of the ways that we're going about doing that at this point, but it really comes back to helping students understand that they can take from our manufacturing experience, they can take that operational expertise leverage that with the digital technology and they can do more because of that merger. Thank you for that explanation, Yuri. Uh, very powerful to see that this, uh, these methods are being used in your classroom and what you and uh, your, your, your students have been able to accomplish. Uh, uh, what a fantastic partnership. Uh, we at Festo really appreciate working with you. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, uh, back to Jerry and uh, can you explain how Siemens works with education institutions as well as manufacturing partners globally in bringing smart manufacturing methods such as digital twin into the classroom? Sure. Uh, next slide, please. So I think what I'll do is take it through a case study and give you an idea of, of, of the reality of, of what we're doing. Uh, I'm sure most people here have heard of this little school called Arizona State University, um, located in uh, Tempe, Arizona, which is, by the way, where I live. Um, we have a lot of companies there, a lot of aerospace companies that are actually doing a lot. Uh, they have a Polytech new university. Actually, it's a campus out uh, in the Mesa area. And their interest in the digital twin, but more importantly, how to help a company improve their uh, throughput, 
how to start looking at optimization, how to do it right first time, were all of the drivers by some of these aerospace companies. Well, they, in partner with us, as well as with the School of uh, Engineering Digital Manufacturing, actually stepped up onto a capstone. And I guess maybe for one takeaway, capstones and design projects, those are the things that start to bring all this together. So we were actually brought together to take a look at a line working within our factory automation organization. But how do you then design a PLC or how do you design a controller? How do you make a digital twin of that? And that's really where the whole capstone started. It wasn't the design of the actual product that they were going to build, but the line. Next slide, please. So the things that we really took a look at was actually leveraging this digital twin in a smart manufacturing optimization perspective. The companies build aircraft engines, uh, they build lines, they build other. So their part was something that we wanted to optimize. How can they build them faster, more quality, and actually bring things together? So developing and designing the line within a digital twin was really the way we went. However, the I'll call it modeling and simulation, keyword simulation, was really the perspective of how do you put then that line together to take care of that product that they want to build and move it through. Next slide, please. The thing that we really took a look at, though, we had requirements. And as Yuri mentioned, system engineering, the whole idea of systems driven design or design for analysis, design for manufacturability, design for automation is critical. And if you look at Industry 4.0 and you really use that as your core foundation, that really is what drove this. So we looked at cyber, we took a look at all of the cyber smarts and, and, and took advantage of digitalization to walk through it. So if you take a look here on the left, and I'm not going to read them all, but you look at how the digital twin, design for manufacturability, embracing digital 4.0, digital transformation are all key components that actually had to be put out. Working with the students within the capstone, this is the learning that they got. Now, a lot of the learning was actually done in the classroom through their normal curriculum, but this is over and above that where you bring the two together. How do you do process-based learning or program-based learning in addition to the learning that you would get through a normal course in curriculum? Next slide, please. So when we really take a look at the case itself, what we were able to do is take a look at the hardware and the software, took a look at the parallel development of the equipment with the element of the Festo product as well as our own product. We looked at faster commissioning to get the line on, online as an example. Uh, and some of the things, PLC programming. A lot of the students actually found ways to, I'll call it divert into new areas. So what, you know, as we all probably heard when we were kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, some people maybe wanted to be an, a pilot or whatever. Well, when they got into the world of manufacturing, there may have been a preconceived notion of what they did. The thing that this really brought to the table was some of the things you've heard some of my colleagues talk about here, cybersecurity, safety. You talk about AR, VR, all the different types of things that may be really interesting. And that's one thing that's really allowed them is to expand. But number two, because you're working in a digital space, you actually have an opportunity now to take a look at the product itself without building anything or hurting anybody because it can be done in a virtual environment. The other thing that we've done is what you're looking at here in the automation is a mechatronics system, okay? We refer to that through our organization. We actually offer certification. So in addition to what the colleges are putting out, they're doing for degrees, for undergrad and graduate degrees, but there's also certification, there's also badging, there's other elements to now what we're able to start to do. What we've done is taken this approach so that we're meeting all of the different types of entities or output. Big trend today going on is not necessarily waiting in order to get that degree, but maybe be certified. And some of the things that you can do is as you're en route to the degree, basically start getting that, ex uh, that experience and actually take a look and getting jobs. I've just hired two, uh, two interns. And interesting enough, I've got two interns that are starting. They haven't graduated yet. And that seems to be the other trend. So the more knowledge that the students can get, the more we can arm them with the tools and the knowledge the better off we're all going to be in the future. Back to you, Ted. Uh, thank you very much for that explanation. Um, and again, uh, Festo 
uh, really uh, appreciates uh, uh, the partnership between uh, Festo and Siemens. And, uh, you know, when we look at uh, this application uh, and the digital twin being realized on our CP Lab system, uh, of course, you know, also using uh, the software platform of MCD, uh, what a powerful tool for students uh, in the education space. Uh, you could just imagine uh, them walking in uh, and getting a job and having this type of experience really speaks to smart manufacturing methods being made tangible. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on uh, back to Chris. Uh, Chris, why is it so important for students as well as incumbent workers uh, to learn about robotic safety methods before stepping into the manufacturing floor? And, and how does SIT go about bringing awareness into the classroom? Yeah, if you go to the next slide for me, there's there's really three steps to each of these. Uh, here, the first one is is the importance, right? Going to your question about why is it important that they understand it before they go into workplace. Understanding requirements and solutions. And what I mean by that is, again, when we talk about safety, a lot of what's required is still regulated by law. In the United States, we have OSHA, the Occupational Safety, safety and Health Administration that sets minimum requirements for uh, safety workers in the workplace. Um, as many of you probably know, a lot of those laws were written 50 years ago and the world of the world in general, but manufacturing specifically has changed dramatically in those 50 years but the regulations haven't. So it, it, in some aspect, when we talk about safety, we're trying to, to merge and marry new technologies, new approaches, things like Industry 4.0 or 5.0 and all the stuff we've been talking about with regulations written based on a, on a worldview that has changed dramatically. So if people don't understand what the, the legal responsibility is, what the liability associated with that is, um, you can think outside the box all you want, but at some point you just have to understand where the boundaries of that playground are. So understanding those requirements and then the solutions that help fulfill those is really important. And by doing that, you start to differentiate applicants. Uh, I've been involved in a, a couple of discussions, even just here in the last few months, where manufacturers are talking about the pool of new candidates, new students coming out of out of educational institutes who understand how to automate things using latest technology, but don't know how to do it safely. Um, the fact that I was in a robotics lab at a large university where he acknowledged there were safety standards and said, I don't have the time or the energy to do it. And I hope that they'll get it somewhere else. And what manufacturers are saying is they, they realize that when they hire people, there's this extra level of, of education that goes into it. So mm -hmm. it, as we emphasize safety education as part of the educational process, to me, that's a huge differentiator. That's a skill set that can be taken anywhere with that with that uh, that worker. And then the last one, of course, the combination of these two: the the understanding of requirements, how to solve it, and having that knowledge in your back pocket. Uh, at the end of the day, is going to reduce workplace injuries, uh, which is what we all want, hopefully. And it's not only does it work reduce the injuries, but it reduces the costs that are associated with those injuries, the downtime, the liability, uh, the retrofits, all those things that go along with it. Uh, essentially, it's if you don't have time to do it right the first time, you're going to have to find time to do it right the second time. So <laughs> if, the more information we arm arm students with, the the better they're going to be at their at their jobs and a better um, um, asset they'll be to the organizations that they join. Uh, so then if you go to the next slide, uh, what we do, our approach at least is, is, is to educate on what current regulations and expectations are while at the same time trying to affect those regulations and expectations. Uh, the, the laws, the, the industry consensus standards that, that dictate how safety is to be implemented, how to ensure uh, an acceptable residual risk in the workplace, um, we try to take the knowledge and the information that we're getting from our customers that we're seeing in the real world and trying to change the worldview so that those expectations more closely match how the world works today. Uh, the example I always use is especially with robotics, right? You look at OSHA laws, the machine's either safe when it's off or it's dangerous when it's on. And in and, and an application where where you have machinery like robotics, where you have slow speed and, and safe modes and all these other things that are not binary of either on or off, uh, we have to have standards that acknowledge that. And, and 
the the transition, the paradigm shift of how people interact with machinery, uh, with robotics, and then going forward into digitalization and cyber and all these other things. It's just the worldview and how the 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 expectation of how workers interact with the machinery is changing, and so the requirements need to change with that. Um, along with that, another thing we do here that you see is uh, it developing and maintaining that information. Uh, it's something that that we at SIC take a lot of of pride in. If you click again. Uh, like example, we have a guide. It's almost 200 page guide on, we call it creating six steps to a safe machine. And it's based on process. It's not based on inherent knowledge. It's based on best practice in the industry. And then the last one here is that we partner with other industry leaders with the great example of the safety awareness bundle that Festo Didactic has in partnership with SICK with the, the robotic modules and how safety is an inherent part of that. Um, so trying to to spread the word far and wide that safety can never be forgotten, that it's absolutely important as long as we still live in a world where humans have to do things in the environmental, uh, in the uh, manufacturing environment. Until we actually get to that lights out manufacturing phase, there's always going to be a person around and we need to make sure that those people are safe, regardless of whether they're directly or indirectly uh, interacting with the machinery that could be controlled from halfway around the world. Thanks so much, Chris. We really appreciate uh, your response. And uh, again, on behalf of Festo, uh, the partnership between Festo and SIC and creating the safety awareness bundle, uh, you know, there's a saying that, you know, teaching robots points, it's, it's very simple. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, you hear, uh, just put a teach pendant in their hand, just put a teach pendant in their hand and get them started. Um, but uh, we want to change that approach along with, uh, with, with SICK Safety. And with our partnership, the goal is to teach the student how to do a risk assessment, teach them how to be safe, uh, and then put a teach pendant in their hand. <laughs> uh, right. Because, mm -hmm. So thanks so much, Chris. We really appreciate you. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to our final question. Why is it important? And that's a free uh, Yuri uh, Havansky. Why is it important to examine the capabilities of, of your control architecture or topologies to make sure that you can bring a data rich experience to life? So it's a really interesting piece as you look at the different types of situation that we have. And let's just go to the next slide, um, Ted. Um, when we compare what we can do with augmented reality and what we, we may be able to do, um, I like the fact that Mark showed us some of the existing technologies that they have, as well as some of the things that we're looking forward to see, forward to seeing in the future, right? But let's, let's just stop and say, okay, from an educational perspective, some of the things that we can do are, are use traditional methodologies. I can augment physical reality with uh, digital information where I can allow a PDF like these uh, pneumatic work instructions or a process flow or whatever I want to be able to put together in the information. I can bring that kind of information up digitally and, and augment um, equipment with, with information. Um, however, that's not really leveraging the benefit that we see from an Industry 4.0 perspective at the level that we'd like to, because while we're taking data and information that's traditionally aware or available to us in many ways, it's not necessarily creating that merger between IT and OT really at that interface. And so one of the benefits of being able to work with teams like PTC and Festo in creating these educational platforms is that we can actually tie into the industry 4.0 nature of using PTC's Vuforia software and their ThingWorks platform to be able to directly tie to data at that architectural level. We can understand the specifics of whether or not we want to dial into a Siemens PLC or a SIG sensor or, or numerous other types of things that we may be connecting into and often are in a, in a very diversified automated environment, be able to aug, uh, or gather all that information together and then be able to augment that out to the individual as, it, as if they were from a seamless source. And that won't matter if it's coming from the overall enterprise data structure out of a PLM system or something like that, or if it's coming off the actual hardware itself, we can augment that information um, and make it available. And that's kind of the difference that we see, right? We can augment that information and that's kind of a level of augmented reality, but as we really understand the architecture underneath the equipment and really um, understand how to interact with that digital um, infrastructure, 
that creates an experience where we can uh, empower the user, and in this case, the student, to really understand what they can do. Um, the example we show here on the right side is instead of having a, a set of pneumatic work drawings out there to understand what these valves MB1 through MB4 are doing, we can actually tie right onto the PLC and understand by touching the test MB4, it will actually actuate that piece from the augmented reality experience and then show us how that's interacting with the sensors live. And the experience can let us know if it's working as it's anticipated or if it's, it's seeing a problem with the overall pneumatics control and operation, all as part of a completely interactive experience. And that changes how we look at things from an educational standpoint, rather than needing to um, put them out um, through a whole test case of explaining how the operations work and how the pneumatic systems engage with the mechanical systems. They can go out there and actually fairly safely work through an experience that's been built out. And it allows us to control the content, the interaction in a way that especially in an interact, um, you know, I'm hearing what uh, Chris is saying all over when it comes to safety. Every time we introduce a new student into an environment, there's always that opportunity. And so um, understanding that architecture and being able to manage the data and that interaction not only enhances their ability to understand it, but to be able to do that in a way that they can safely interact both with the digital architecture and with the physical reality. And that's really that benefit that augmented reality and a fully connected and immersive augmented reality experience creates at the educational level. So that's kind of, it's a real win from us from both sides. It allows them to see and understand Industry 4.0 in a greater degree, but it also helps them uh, interact in a way that we can control the safety, control the content in a way that we can uh, march them through. So that's really kind of the uh, gist of why not just augmenting information, but really understanding that architectural level and how we connect into the digital infrastructure, both from the enterprise and from a hardware is critical to enabling the augmented reality environment. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that explanation, Yuri. We really appreciate it. Um, so uh, uh, before we get into the questions, just a quick wrap up. So when we talk about smart manufacturing methods, uh, today uh, we talked about cyber physical systems and defining that on the forefront of our mind. Um, and when you have that uh, uh, interoperability in place, meaning uh, not a cable that runs from one piece of equipment to another with 24 volts that says on or off, but cyber physical systems are meaning that you're pushing uh bytes of data, okay, uh, into, so you can visualize it. We're talking about uh, typically uh, ethernet cables, uh, allowing you to push several bytes of data or information. Um, and then we also, there's also applications that operate on the edge. But in the end, uh, the goal is that you have, uh, you have the ability to push and pull data collect information, okay? And so by doing that, you step into the system approach. And now you're able to bring to life your digital twins, augmented reality, what we talked about. Uh, and then of course, the robotic safety side of things, as well as collecting data. Um, Overall, when we look at those four points, uh, robotic safety, the system approach, cyber physical systems, and the digital twin, all of these methods can be brought to life uh, uh, in partnership with, with Festo. We, we do offer an overall um, product line in our MPS stations, our cyber physical uh, labs, and cyber physical factories where we are bringing uh, smart manufacturing methods to life. Uh, so now what we'll do is go ahead and I turn uh, things back over to uh, Craig. And Craig, thank you so much. If you could please uh, uh, let us know if there are any questions. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the expertise on this screen for the last 50 minutes has been unparalleled. And like I said, the A-team was definitely here with Industry 4.0. Uh, one of the things Brian Wilson and I, who who heads up the uh, he chairs the uh, EWAC, which is, stands for the Educational Workforce uh, Advisory Council for the ARM Group Institute for Robotics, uh, and I are chatting back and forth about youth apprenticeships. That's my version of it, pre-apprenticeships. And some of the companies that we've talked with over the last year, like Mercedes in Alabama and Boeing uh, in Washington State, are 
uh, open to and have actually hired 16 and 17 year olds in a safe environment as pre-apprentices in the fields that they're needing more employees in. And I just wonder if anybody on this team would like to address what trends we're seeing, especially around the safety part, which is the most important boundary and liability that companies of small, medium and larger are worried about 16 and 17 year, year old folks. Um, anybody want to comment on that would be wonderful to hear, hear from you all, anybody there. So this Jerry, I think one of the first things, uh, I think you hit it right on the head. Uh, you know, back in the day, people looked at undergrad and graduates as being the target audience, but right now it's secondary schools, meaning high schools, and community colleges. And I think getting the talent at that level, but there's also the caution and you hit it on the head with the safety element because we've gone to such an environment now where, you know, these machines are get out of control pretty easy. So people like OSHA and everything are very, very critical. So the, I'll call it the boundaries that you work in need to be defined really well, but don't be afraid to go deeper. In fact, we've even started looking at elementary school, some of the gifted kids that are coming out of sixth, seventh and middle school. And actually there's an intent and there's a want to do that. And with drones that they design now and everything, you know, you just put your mind out a little bit and figure, hey, a machine tool is very similar to what a drone can do. It's all robot, robotic and everything like Ted was just talking about. So, you know, it, it's definitely a trend in definitely areas that we're going in. Great, great. Uh, before the pandemic, we were on the, the road out in different states, New York and Florida and California, doing a demystifying industry 4.0 for small and medium-sized companies, as well as educators in the same room, mostly community college level, uh, but some four-year institutions. And that was seemingly getting a lot of juices flowing. But wherever we go to consult and talk to the communities about you know, what they're doing with industry. But we know most of the small and medium, and you know that's 80 to 85% of the employers in manufacturing are not even close to getting there with industry 4.0. You can mention sensors and dashboards and robotics and they can chime in a little bit, but they're actually worried about that not being something they can actually handle uh, because of its, uh, they need a champion and most of them don't have that. Any comments about how small and medium-sized companies and community colleges can help them get over that barrier? I'll, I'll kind of jump out there, uh, um, uh, Craig. Um, and I think it kind of goes back to Mark's uh, comment on the adaption or adoption of augmented reality and how simple it is um, where, where it starts with. Uh, so there is a piece that um, you know, with any advanced technology, um, th there's, you know, we we typically, when we start to hear algorithms and uh, we start backing up saying, oh, I could never do that. But the storyboarding, um, which is something that uh, Yuri has done a fantastic job in, in assisting uh, Festo in bringing uh, curriculum content around augmented reality. The storyboarding process uh, is all about, if, if you take storyboarding and start off with just, um, it, it's the foundation of ladder logic, relay logic, <laughs> storyboarding is, 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 is what brings to life uh, the ability of the frontline worker to make the best decisions ever. Okay, so th there is a lot of ways to get started. Um, and, 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 you know, the, uh, I don't want to take over that question if there was anyone else that would like to make a statement there. I think well, that's I'll, a really interesting comment. Um, but ahead, one thing Jerry. real quick, I think there was the fear of the unknown. I think, Craig, your, your point about 20 to 30%, I'll say that are not, uh, a, a, a maybe absorbing it, okay? And the rest of them are afraid. Um, I'm sitting right now in, in one of our customers, which is a five-man shop, and they do a lot of digital manufacturing here. The fact is, in talking to the president, you know, when, when they are put up against an OEM that wants to do this, like a Boeing or somebody big, you know, they've got deep pockets. Is This is him talking, but these little guys don't. So there's the fear of cost, but there's also the fear of the unknown. And I think one of the biggest things that we've attempted to do, and I think we're being pretty successful, is to calming that fear a little bit. You know, it's something that, you know, it's easier than you think. You get the kids, and guess what? Kids today, they're not afraid of it. It's the people in the middle that are afraid of it that are trying to guide them. So I think it's that whole ecosystem that's got to be addressed. Right on, right on, Jerry. Last comment from somebody else there on the team? Yeah, I think uh, Jerry hit it on the... I hit the nail on the head there with the situation when it comes to 
uh, we get a lot of this resistance at that middle level. A lot of the newer people coming in are actually not only finding that interacting with the digital things is preferable, but they they get excited about coming back into manufacturing almost because of the nature that they have to work on the digital side of things. But the other benefit there that's really critical is the software tools have developed a long ways. I mean, if I look at all of the software tools from where they were 20 years ago when I was coming out of school to where they are today, uh, the ability for people to get in and use them without really understanding the software side of it and, and really have added tools that are designed to be able to minimize the need for them to get into a hard coding environment, even from a standpoint of something like CAD, what I can do in a CAD environment and how fast I can get somebody up in that environment is a very different role from where it was when everything was a Unix-based platform and we were in, living in a different world, right? It's just the, the, the software tools allow us to integrate with hardware in a way that we just couldn't before. And that really helps us as we work with younger and younger students, but also with these SMEs and trying to understand how they can bring that to life, even in a place where they don't have a a fully uh, developed IT team to be able to deal with infrastructure, software changes and hardware interfaces. They can do that in many cases with a full stack solution today, but that just wasn't viable even two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. Spot on, Yuri, spot on. Well, we're right up against the clock and I think there's been some good conversation back and forth behind the scenes. There's some great folks on from colleges across the nation and uh, can't help uh, say one more time, our great thanks to Festo and Siemens as our longtime strategic partners in the NCATC uh, ecosystem. And this recording will be on our website in the next 48 hours. For those of you who want to review it again or share it with others, please feel free. And I really appreciate all of your wonderful and passionate expertise today on this webinar, as data is the new oil, which is a great catchphrase, Ted. Thanks again. <laughs> See you soon. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Everybody. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.